Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by the ever steady, fantastic Ricardo Martinez. But more importantly today, we are interviewing Patrick Melder, the author of two books, um, one being The Christian Case for Bitcoin uh, and host of his own podcast, Mission Bitcoin Podcast, and the man behind Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala. So a lot going on there. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, Lawrence. I thought you were going to say the myth behind the project in Guatemala. No, but I'm doing great. Um, thanks for having having me on and love to talk about my books and uh, the project down in Guatemala. It's uh, yeah, a lot going on, but when you develop a passion and uh, see something that needs to be fixed, especially in Bitcoin land, uh, we we tend to kind of go after it. And that's kind of what, what I've done with uh, actually both of these projects. Um, the, the, my writing, my, my podcast and, and the, the project down in, in Guatemala. But uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I'm happy to chat about it. And uh, I think people listening already will be able to tell there's a, there's quite a lot for you to talk about and us to get into today. Uh, yeah, you're right. I should have said the man, the myth, the legend, but I didn't do it. <laughs> I missed out on an absolute opportunity, but never mind. It is what it is. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, I suppose my first, um, first question to get us off here is, um, who was Patrick before Bitcoin? How the hell did you find it? And what was life like before then? How did you find it? And then, yeah, like, I guess like, yeah, basically I want to hear your story, man. Like I want to hear the story. Cause obviously you, there's like, you know, the, the books there's, there's Guatemala. It's obviously you're not, well, I don't think you're from Guatemala originally, but I could be wrong. Um, didn't think so. So it's kind of like, Hey, I want to know what's going on. How did this come about? How did Bitcoin happen in your life? Great. Awesome. All right. So before the, these projects, I was a busy surgeon. I'm an ear, nose and throat surgeon by training and also a busy entrepreneur. I've, I've, uh, I've uh, started two companies. I have, uh, I don't know, 30 plus patents and um, was in practice in my, and as a surgeon for about 20 years and fell into Bitcoin in about um, 2018 and at the time, it was like I think for everybody when you first um, purchase Bitcoin, it, it's kind of an investment, and that's kind of what I was looking at it for. But I, I fundamentally understood when I first saw it that there was something unique about it. And for me, it was the the quote unquote blockchain aspect of it of of keeping record of stuff that I thought was very unique. And I was actually in Mexico the first time I bought Bitcoin, and realizing that. Well, this could be a really transformational technology for people in developing countries. And at the time, I wasn't thinking as a monetary asset. I was just thinking the blockchain technology to keep track of, you know, property records. You know, if there's a civil war and you've got something on the blockchain that that codifies that you own a piece of land, then that would uh, provide some sort of property rights. So I had kind of a nascent understanding of, of property rights when I first came across Bitcoin. But as a a busy surgeon and running my own business, I just I just was overwhelmed and I kind of just forgot about it, dollar cost averaged into it. And it wasn't really until the end of uh, 2020 when I started, you know, like a lot of people, we had a lot of time on our hands um, to kind of think about things and read about things. And that's kind of when I started going down the, the rabbit hole of trying to understand what is Bitcoin. And even before that time, I was, I didn't know the term, but I was definitely a Bitcoin maxi because I had looked at other altcoins um, and I just decided just practically speaking that there's just, there's something special about Bitcoin and these other things just don't look like Bitcoin. So from a very pragmatic and practical viewpoint, I came to the conclusion that Bitcoin was kind of it before I became a an orange peeled maxi um, with reading everything and, and going down the proverbial rabbit hole. So that's kind of who I was before. And my nexus with Guatemala is, I was telling Ricardo before we started recording, when my girls were younger in middle school, high school, we would go down to Guatemala every year from 2012 to 2018. We had met a couple that went to our church and they were doing work down in Guatemala. And we wanted to introduce them to Christian mission and service and all that. And so every year we went down to 
uh, Lake Atitlan Panachel, where we're, we're now based with this project. And we did a, uh, an art camp and developed relationships, basically trust relationships. And that's who we kind of reconnected with when we wanted to kind of implement this, this program of, of Bitcoin Lake. And the, the whole idea of Bitcoin Lake was, was kind of coincident with me learning about Bitcoin Beach. But um, I think that the for me, as I was learning about Bitcoin and learning about um, what it could do for uh, developing countries as the savings technology, the freedom that it brings, um, you know, Alex Gladstein, his, his work really influenced my thinking about how Bitcoin could be used in a developing country. And as I was reading him, learned about Bitcoin Beach and then reflecting back on my time in Guatemala, I thought, wow, let's do a similar project down in Guatemala. So that's kind of how it all came together. And we started doing some planning and reconnected with Nancy, who, who owns the school, uh, Nancy Sifuentes, who owns the school that we work out of now, based the project out of. And we did a scouting trip back in December of last year, 2021. And then um, after that, we officially launched the, the project in January of this year. So it's very new, but I mean, we've had tremendous success and I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I'm, I've, I'll, I'm, I'll love to talk to you about what we've done so far and, and you know, what we've learned and, and what, what Bitcoin Beach has provided for us as well, as far as learning and, and real support. So that, that's, all, that's all kind of wound in there. Sounds like you've been up to, you've been up to a lot. You can kind of tell. And, and I think, um, well, something that's interesting to me is when we spoke to the Galloway guys, he spoke to uh, the guys on the ground at Bitcoin Beach before. Um, I've had like some private discussions with, I think it was the Bitcoin Beach Brazil before um, in Jericho. Wow. I can't say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wherever that is. Uh, I think it's in the north of Brazil. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, each, in the, each of these occasions, it's always people who, uh, already have been or are or whatever doing things around community projects anyway and already trying to help an area and they're like okay well this is a way for to kind of in, sort of strengthen the local community and help people uh kind of get bring more independence to the people actually in the community like if they can start accepting the bitcoin and they can then profit and generate from that and so it's often people who are already doing something good that just sort of see this as an opportunity to hey make it even better for the people there which is pretty damn cool uh for sure i mean you said about the bitcoin beach guys is get I, I shoot i understand you guys are working with galloy to like and use the bitcoin beach wallet and so how mm -hmm. much uh have you guys been working alongside with them like how much assistance have they given you what's the situation like there did you get in touch with them uh, to discuss it in first yeah oh yeah yeah so uh, let me i'll answer that question let me let me back up a little bit about you know my the the entryway into my podcast and my my books because it 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 provides a segue into this this project because um, because of my faith background, being a Christian, um, I know there are quite a few uh, Christian Bitcoiners that I saw on Twitter, but I didn't see a lot of information or resources for the Christian to think in terms of Bitcoin. And so that's, I started writing because I saw a lot of similarities between my faith and Bitcoin. And which is kind of, it may seem odd if you've not heard that before, but I was definitely seeing it. And for me at the time, I thought, wow, this is really strange. Uh, I even, you know, I prayed about it. I was like, Lord, this, this is kind of weird. Is, is this right for me to be thinking like this? And finally, I decided, okay, I'm just going to write about it. So I started writing on Medium and got a fairly good response out of Medium on who, who saw my articles. And then I wanted to go kind of talk, uh, get on podcast and talk about this Christian perspective with, with Bitcoin. And I had, I introduced myself over Twitter to Jordan Bush and so uh, found a, a like mine there. But um, it's, it's really through my writing, through my podcast that I started formulating, you know, how this could be done in Guatemala and, and ultimately how the community, how the community could get involved. I knew um, having spent that time within the Bitcoin community, that Bitcoin is a community and, you know, people go rogue, um, don't get very far in Bitcoin. I think that Bitcoin's all about um, getting people involved. And, and um, so I, that was another reason why I spent time um, doing my podcast. I wanted to bring awareness to this, this concept and have people come along beside me and, and help. 
So then along that, that journey of, of kind of discovering what was going on um, with Bitcoin Beach and who was involved in that project, I met um, Chris Hunter of Galoy and uh, he invited me to come down to Adopting Bitcoin last year. And then I connected with the Ebex Mercado guys and they also invited me to come down to uh, uh, San Salvador. And so I went down there and I had... Um, already planned to go to Guatemala about two weeks after that meeting. But I went down there to meet those guys, tell them what I was doing, make sure that, especially with Ebex, it's like, okay, I'm going to be in your backyard, so to speak. want to make sure that, you know, if I'm in country and I need support, you know, there's somebody I can call and, and get help or, you know, as we're deploying, you know, whatever wallet, we hadn't made a decision about a wallet yet, whatever wallet we decide to deploy, um, are we going to have the technical support or the back end support to make sure that it, that it's a, a success. And then went to El Zante, saw what was going on there and interviewed Mike Peterson for my podcast. And I guess one thing led to another and ultimately decided because of the functionality of the Bitcoin Beach wallet, the, the map feature, which is, I think, a, a tremendous selling point, uh, especially if you're trying to introduce the uh, Bitcoin into a community. And if those, uh, those of you who don't haven't used the Bitcoin Beach wallet, there's a couple of unique features to it. One is there's a map feature. So you can zoom in on a map and you can see that, okay, in El Zante, this business takes Bitcoin, or in our case, in Ponichel, this business takes Bitcoin. And so when you're trying to onboard a new business and they're skeptical, which they all were, I mean, we were literally in a almost digitally naive environment in, in Pana HL. But, you know, if you could show a map of all these businesses that are accepting Bitcoin around you, that's, that's a really compelling um, sales tactic, so to speak. And you can't do that with the moon wallet and you can't do that with the blue wallet or wallet of Satoshi. With those wallets, all you can say is, this is a Bitcoin wallet and all these people around you are using it, but you don't really have any proof. So the map feature in the Bitcoin Beach wallet is really important. And then the, the username in the Bitcoin Beach wallet is really important, almost like the Strike app. And so, um, but one of the pain points that we figured out pretty quickly, and, and we knew this going into it, but um, the, there is no national currency conversion to the Kitsal in the Bitcoin Beach wallet. So it was USD and Bitcoin, and that was it, because uh, El Salvador is a dollarized economy. And we decided we we're going to push past that. And it turned out that it wasn't really that big of a deal. Most people, if you're a business owner, you're pretty good with numbers and you can do a currency conversion pretty quickly. So that wasn't that big of a deal, but it was, a, it, it was kind of a pain point. And obviously, the, the other major issue is volatility, uh, which we, we'll talk about as well. But Galoy has ended up being a really good company that has supported our efforts. Um, just on the back end, you know, if we have questions about, hey, you know, the wallet's not doing what I want it to do, or we need to add this business to the to the map, they've been very, very supportive and helpful. So there's no financial commitments or anything like that. But I think as a team, they're they've just been a very responsive uh, team, and that and that's that's been really helpful for us. Uh, Patrick, I wanted to ask you. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I'm also a Christian. Um, I think one of the main criticisms Bitcoin gets from the Christian community is that it's potentially like a mark of the beast, cashless society kind of thing. What's your rebuttal to that? I'm really interested to hear you. Well, I actually wrote a chapter on that. So there, I wrote a, a chapter specifically on, with for most people who, who are listening and don't know, I mean, Christians, obviously we come from a certain worldview and we, we think a certain way. Um, and that's not good or bad. It's just the way it is. And so with that comes a certain amount of Christian FUD. And one of those is the mark of the beast. And, you know, I'm, I'm older than both of you. And when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, the mark of the beast was the barcode. So um, that that was just that was Christian FUD back then. Right. So the I, I think that to answer your question as succinctly as I could. Why is it not the mark of the beast? Because it's completely decentralized. It's not about control. It's about freedom. And um, if you believe in Satan, if you believe in the mark of the beast and the end times, that's all going to be about manipulation, control and, and centralization. And, and Bitcoin is the complete antithesis to that. So that's that's the very short answer to that question. Yeah. 
And that answer makes me feel like it's yeah, almost like the complete opposite of the mark of the beast, and almost like a defense towards it. I guess. I mean, I don't know yeah. too much about it. I mean, I uh, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I'm almost probably jealous of Christians, in, and I know jealousy is a sin, but whatever. Um, because of the the faith side of things, that I just don't necessarily have in my life. But um, yeah, it definitely it's interesting to see different religions as well. Like I know um, I see things how there's like uh, Islamic. Uh, oh, what's the word? high up people in islam i can't think of the right word right imams, now imams um, imams imams and things say like oh that it is um it's like permitted and things like that because obviously some people are concerned within their different religious communities right like mm-hmm. um so they'll look for for guidance uh, from imams and, and and i'm sure in other religions it's the same thing um so it's interesting to see yeah people say like whether it's haram or not in islam and, and similarly in other religions um, i think rabbis have co-signed it too like from the jewish religion as well right and i, yeah, I was that- asked yeah Oh, no, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was asked that by uh, Cedric on his Cedric Youngelman on his podcast, The Bitcoin Matrix. And, you know, when I as when he asked me that, I thought, well, that's a good point. But I think that it doesn't matter. We we can debate, you know, our faiths and, and all that. And that's been done through the centuries. But for the purpose of this discussion, I think what's important to understand is that Bitcoin's good. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're a Buddhist or you're a Muslim, you're usually seeking a higher good in your life and you're seeking order from chaos. Um, now, we can debate, you know, which one's right and which one's wrong, but in essence, you're, you're seeking a higher good. And I think certainly Bitcoin can be adopted by every single religion because it is a higher order. It is a higher good. And I don't think it's contradictory to any religion, um, but in fact, my second book, the, the Philosophy of Bitcoin and Religion, specifically addresses the marriage of Bitcoin and, and Christianity and how they're completely in uni- unity. So um, that, that, that's a, that was a fun thing to write about. And that was actually a, in response, actually, to John Vallis's work. And I just got to the tipping point of like, oh, OK, I've got to I've got to respond to this. So I ended up writing a book about it. And, and he's only there's only one um, he's only one example. There are several other people out there. I think of um, I, I, I'm blanking on the names, but there are several other people out there. Kaysen, Eric Kaysen and Vallis and uh, Farhas that are pretty militant atheists and their views uh, and i don't john Vallis is not a militant atheist but the other ones uh come across as like that but anyway the um my my goal with the the philosophy of bitcoin and religion was to go through logical proofs and demonstrate how christianity is in line with bitcoin and in fact bitcoin can prove the existence of god so that's what i did in that book regrettably i haven't read your books but now that i'm hearing you talk about them i'm going to have to yeah, I'm, 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 I'm interested myself. And yeah, that's coming from someone who's not necessarily super religious. So it sounds interesting to me, to be honest. Uh, yeah. And I, well, I, for you, uh, I would recommend the, the second one first, the, the philosophy of Bitcoin and religion. That's the one I would recommend for you first. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause it sounds to me like that's more of a explaining, yeah, how, like, as you said, like Bitcoin can help actually pr- provide proof and et cetera. Whereas the first one sounds more like, um, not a guidebook necessarily, but almost like the Bitcoin standard for Christians in a weird yep, way. And that's exactly, of, yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. That's what it sounded like when I read the the, the summary, et cetera, and looked it, looked it up. Um, so yeah, it seems pretty interesting to me. Um, I suppose, yeah, definitely the, the time between religion and, and, and Bitcoin. And obviously, it definitely feels like religion is the thing that's kind of helped make this whole project happen as well with, with Bitcoin Lake, because you were there uh, in the first place trying to help with that. And then now, obviously, you, you kind of saw the alignment and said, oh, hey, we can we can actually make this into a sort of further uh, project. Um, it'd be interesting to see, like, for you, what would you what would you say have been some of like the, the, the biggest like challenges, I guess, with the whole Bitcoin Lake side of things, because obviously with the, with the book, there's, there's the challenges that many people can probably imagine. It's like, it's hard to write a book in the first mm-hmm. place, and then you've got to get it out there and then you've got to get people to buy it. Um, but with like this kind of project, it's such a new thing to have a Bitcoin uh, community project. It's, I mean, there's only f- five, six well-known ones around the world. If, mm-hmm. if that. So mm-hmm. like, what, what are some of like the real, challenges being behind this like what's the kind of sticky stuff where you're like oh this is a pain in the ass or, or or whatever that i guess you could enlighten us with i suppose being that you would have experienced it um like the bitcoin beach guys did there's not been any sort of uh why am i doing this sort of thing 
um, I think that what most people don't understand is that it requires a lot of work. And um, so l- let me let me explain, you know, what we're doing in how we're doing it in Panachel, and that that will maybe kind of describe what I'm what I'm telling you. So, and and first of all, um, yes, my faith informs my presence down in Guatemala. But like I always like to tell people, um, what we're doing down with with Bitcoin Lake is not evangelic at all. So. You, People from all over the world, all faiths or backgrounds can come and help. And, you know, we're not going to be talking about Jesus unless you ask me. So um, for anybody who wants to come and help, please come and help. We just had a wonderful couple uh, come up and, you know, there was no religion involved in that at all. So but so the I think that for us, the first thing was we had our trust relationships with Nancy already established She reached out to the community and got meetings with key leaders in the in the community and in particular with the mayor. And so we didn't really we haven't really faced any political backlash or or backlash from the community per se. So that 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 was good. And demographically, Panachel is a community of about 18,000 people. So it's about five times larger than Bitcoin Beach. Um, There are a lot of tourists in the area. Um, The lake region is home to about 15 or 17 other uh, cities of various sizes around the lake. And Ponachel is kind of the launching point for a lot of people to come. But, uh, you know, going to the different shop owners and vendors and street vendors, the they're they're really digitally naive. I mean, they, they may have a cell phone, they may have a smartphone, but it's not like they understand um, a lot about it. They're, it's more of a utility tool. So gotcha. when, yeah. I didn't want to cut you off, but yeah. is, is Guatemala like similar to El Salvador and Colombia where like a great percentage of the population like has no access to the banking system? Yeah, so great question. So it's about 60% uh, lower than in El Salvador, but the the region that we're in, which is in the western highlands of Guatemala, there's a lot, there's a, a much larger indigenous population. So while overall 60% of Guatemalans, I would suspect that in where we are, it's probably pushing 70% just because of the demographics. Um, and so when you're going to the different vendors and uh, shop owners to kind of describe, you know, what Bitcoin is, what a Bitcoin wallet is. There's, there's immediate suspicion, that's number one, because it's a new technology and it's a new money. I mean, even in the Western uh, world, we, we get that kind of suspicion. But um, it requires pounding the pavement, going literally door to door, saying, hey, this is who we are. I'm, I, I, I make it clear up front. I'm a philanthropist. There's no fees here. I'm not getting anything out of this. And... Um, that's the hardest part is it takes time. We can't, we, we've tried to have meetings where we said, okay, we're going to, we're going to have a Bitcoin meeting and we're going to teach you about Bitcoin and, and give you free Satoshis, but no one comes to those. And so it, I, it, in our community, it requires pounding the pavement and pressing and pressing and pressing. And obviously when you get the no and you get the no and you get the no from the same person over and over, that's going to be a no, but um, we do get no's, we come back and we get yeses. And it's just, it's a classic sales job. I mean, you, you just have to be passionate about what you're selling and uh, provide a benefit for the user. And we're doing all that. And you can't sell everything to everybody. And that's kind of how we view uh, the project here. We can't make everybody in Pana Chell accept Bitcoin. And I think the other thing that's kind of challenging for us is we have a chicken egg thing. So you know, I with with Mike Peterson and the Bitcoin Beach guys, they they had a large infusion of Bitcoin to begin with. They started um, using it for UBI, especially during the pandemic. Um, and then they had the wallet technology. So they they had they really had everything they they needed. And for us, we don't have Bitcoin in the community. We're, we're not we're, we've bootstrapped everything. And so when we walk up and we tell a vendor, you know, we want you to start accepting Bitcoin the they're like well um uh, no one's asked me to accept one so why do i want to start accepting it now and then that's when we start talking about the return and using it as a savings technology but um, that's kind of one of the challenges for us is to 
continue to infuse Bitcoin into the community once you orange pill somebody. And that's been a challenge. Uh, we're just now starting to see a trickle of Bitcoin tourists. But, you know, let's face it, Bitcoin Beach kind of sucks up all that because they're so well known. And everybody wants to go there. And I'm not faulting that, but they, they kind of suck all the, the air out of the balloon. And we're just trying to get some folks to come to Panachel in the lake, um, which is just a tremendously beautiful area. And it's coming, I think, by the summer, later this summer, we'll have many more else, uh, many more Salvadoran visitors that come and want to spend their Bitcoin in, in, uh, in the lake region. Yeah, it's not too far geographically from El Salvador, right? So it's not like a crazy idea to to visit both if you're if you're someone who's really interested in doing so. Um, yeah, and then it's my- cheaper too, right? If you have dollars from El Salvador to go spend quetzales in Guatemala, probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, we're what, so what we're trying to do is, yeah, they're next door neighbors, so geographically they're neighbors. Uh, from San Salvador to Panachel, it's about six hours by bus. And, um, you know, if you think about it, if, if you're going to travel across the state, you're going to go to the airport, spend two hours at the airport, get on the plane and, you know, you'll, you'll spend that just traveling across the state. So it's not that big of a big of a deal. What we're trying to do for this next year adopting Bitcoin Summit in San Salvador is we would like to and we've gotten a lot of positive support and feedback on Twitter. Uh, we'd like to have a side trip to uh, Pana HL. So if you've already been to El Zante and you want to come see what's going on in Pana, uh, we're going to we're going to um, set up a mini adopting Bitcoin seminar in Pana HL and, uh, you know, arrange for bus transportation and all that. So people can come and actually see the area um, and see something different than um, uh, Bitcoin uh, Beach. Out of curiosity, how many uh, like local business owners have you guys uh, successfully managed to onboard? Oh, it's like over 50 at this point. Um, so we've done since, since January of this year, over 50, uh, we're about to double that number. Um, so effectively in principle, we have about a hundred businesses cause we've, we've brought on a, um, a large motorcycle chain, motor, motor shop chain in Guatemala, uh, to start accepting Bitcoin. So we're, we're super excited about that and more details to follow on that. But the, the, um, the interesting thing about that, Ricardo, is one of my passions or visions for Guatemala is we've got to fundamentally change how we orange peel people in Guatemala. The Guatemalan government is so freaking corrupt, and I, I think it's going to be years before they have somebody like a Bukele that would impose a, a Bitcoin legal tender law. So what we're really trying to do and what we're trying to think through, and we've got some really cool ideas that we're, that we're thinking about, but, you know, Bitcoin adoption in Guatemala has got to be from the ground up. And um, I think that's the way Guatemalans would want it. I think that th- there would probably be even more backlash to Bitcoin in Guatemala if what Bukele did in El Salvador, because the, the, the government in Guatemala is just, it's, it's really bad. Geographically close, but very different situation politically. It sounds like, yeah, yeah, um, that's for sure. I mean, I um, if you were say, I, I'm asking this because obviously I'm interested, but also I think people out there listening might be interested. Say I was going to fly in, and you know, I, I'm not interested in going to El Salvador yet or whatever. I'm going to fly there, whatever. Um, if you're flying in, like, is there an airport nearby, and then do you get like a taxi or like how, what's the best way to get there from like an airport? Well, what, so you fly into Guatemala City, which is the closest airport um, to Panachel. And that's the capital. And when the visitors that we've had, we actually arrange for people to uh, be picked up. So we'll make sure that somebody meets you at the airport with, and you trust them because you know them and they've got your name on a placard. So we, we basically arrange all that. Now, if you're a savvy world traveler, you can just get on a, um, a private taxi and take it to Panachel, which is about a three hour drive. But, um, you know, we, we try to make sure that if people are coming to visit, we take care of them for sure. No, that makes so, sense. So if anybody wants to come, please reach out to me uh, because we'll make sure that, you know, you're not looking for Waldo. Is Panachel like a, like a backpackers, like hostel kind of like place? Uh, like yep. what are the amenities like for someone that would want to visit out there? Well, you can, you, you have a lot of backpackers through there. So a lot of young uh, kids coming through um, that are hiking 
you have a lot of hostels, you have Airbnbs, and you even have five-star hotel, uh, Hotel Atatlan, which is an absolutely beautiful um, hotel on the lake. You, I mean, it's really, it's a pretty developed, you know, touristy area. And it's, you know, the, I'll tell you this, though, the food is not that great in Guatemala in particular, but I think that the, the um, I think in particular, uh, a lot of good Guatemalan, and there are good Guatemalan cooks, but I think what happens is there's been a brain drain of good cooks. They, they, um, they don't want to be living in, you know, the backwoods of, of Guatemala. So they, they immigrate or they're working in Guatemala city or something like that. But, um, there is good food. Um, but don't, don't be surprised if you're not happy with the food choices. <laughs> Another question that I had is I know a lot of people travel to Guatemala specifically to see like the Mayan ruins and the pyramids and stuff like that. How close is Panachel to, to those? It depends. Um, I think the closest uh, Mayan ruins are about two hours from Panachel. Um, some of the larger ones in the north of the country are about six hours away. And that's that's by uh, vehicle. You can fly. There, there are um, smaller airports that you can fly into um, if you want to travel and see some of the larger Mayan ruins. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think when we're in El Salvador, um, it sounds like we were there at the same time because I was there when, for adopting Bitcoin um the food there i was like is it better than in guatemala did you find because i found it pretty good to be honest when i was eating it yeah i i i have i i did think when i was there that the food in el salvador was better than in guatemala gotcha yeah. okay yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, fair it's enough. not it's not bad it's it's not bad don't get me wrong but um it's not going to be a culinary experience <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're not you're not coming out for the michelin staff no is, is no no no, no, that's fair enough. Yeah. That makes a, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. I, I I can understand that. To be honest, it's not really a yeah, uh, yeah. major thing. I guess um yeah, it sounds like well, it sounds like you're definitely doing a, a pretty cracking job so far of of getting things up and running since it's been just January and you've already got fifty and then essentially a hundred or so. Like, do you think? Because at the moment, obviously, yeah, it depends who you ask. But realistically, we're kind of entering less of a crazy bullish territory for Bitcoin price, uh, and and obviously the price impacts you're often new people coming in it seems like it's not so bad this time compared to the last time but who knows mm -hmm. um do you do you think like you know are you are you kind of concerned about like how that may impact things as the tourism or do you think are you just seeing it continuing to rise no matter what the price action is i, I th um i think this is going to help us because when we first started introducing bitcoin bitcoin was about um in the 40s, uh, high 40s. Um, I think it even got up into the mid 50s. And so when the shop owners started seeing the Bitcoin price go down, even though we talk about volatility, you know, um, they were like, what's going on with Bitcoin? And now that it's kind of grinding along, I, I and then, you know, there it's going to go up at some point. So I think for us, as we have stability in the price of Bitcoin, I think that's going to relieve anxiety for the, the Guatemalans. And then obviously, when it shoots up going into the next halving, which, you know, no one can predict, but uh, I think it's going to, um, I think that's going to really help our case. But I, right now, I think that the grind in the thirties is, is um, beneficial for us for adoption, for sure. Uh, Patrick, I wanted to ask, like, what is the average Guatemalan citizens understanding of Bitcoin? And I know you're kind of a maxi, but like, do, are they interested in other uh, cryptocurrencies as well? That's a great, those are two good questions. So the, the first understanding is that they know they've heard of Bitcoin, but they don't really understand it. And so they, un, they know about Bitcoin because of what's going on next door in El Salvador. So that that's given us a opportunity to say, well, Hey, you know, here's what's going on in El Salvador. Do you want to learn about Bitcoin? And that, that opens the door for us. Now, as far as being a maxi, no, they don't, they don't, most of them are, have not been introduced or they barely know about Bitcoin. So they don't really know about um, the other um, crap coins out there. The now, and that, that presented a challenge for us because there was another project um, around the lake that was crypto at And we were adamant that, you know, and we, we had a couple of exchanges that want, wanted to, um, wanted us to participate with them and invite and do some work with them. But we just did not want to expose Guatemalans to inflationary coins. Um, I mean, they're already trusting us to talk about a new type of money. And 
you know, the, the case in point with Luna, that would have been tragic had a uh, local Guatemalan put their money in Luna um, seeking yield or whatever. Um, so, so they're, they're not very aware of it, but it's like everything else, you know, as soon as we get a lot of traction, um, you know, the, the, the shit coin casino guys are going to start coming, moving in on, on the territory. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that's going to come and we just, we just have to educate, educate, educate. I know with Bitcoin Beach, like they made the community aware that they were accepting donations in Bitcoin. Like, is there a way that people can donate to Lake Bitcoin? Yes. So on our Twitter feed, Twitter handle, we have a Bitcoin address. And on our webpage, uh, BitcoinLake.io, you can donate there as well. And you can see who else is involved in the, in the project. And um, I don't know if we're going to talk about it, but I definitely want to talk about our, our philosophy and our Bitcoin mining project that we're, that we're working into as well. Let's talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was going to ask you, actually, you know, I, I saw some bits about like, um, oh, I can't exactly remember what I was looking at before, but um, I saw some things about how like uh, potentially you could give each people something uh, around the lake that would then generate some way. I can't remember exactly what you're saying, um, but I wanted to ask you exactly about that. Like, because it sounds a little bit different to uh, Bitcoin Beach. So it sounds like something that's sort of a little bit alternative. It'd be awesome to hear about like, the differences there and like the kind of vision you've got. I'd be uh, really interesting. Yeah, great. So the, you know, the overall vision is, you know, the kind of the pillars of what we're doing there is we educate. So we're working in the school, we're teaching the kids about Bitcoin. Um, you know, we've, we've brought down seed signers and they've started assembling the seed signers. We have a full node running down there. We even have a miner plugged in. We actually gave a miner to an S9 miner to the municipality and um, first municipality in Central and South America that, that we're aware of. And actually in the Americas, because about two weeks before my last visit, uh, Fort Worth announced that they were um, they plugged in some miners at, at City Hall, and you know we beat uh, Fort Worth, and they were the first city in America, so uh, we beat them for by about eight weeks. Um, so we're doing that, yeah. Uh, so education, bringing technology, and the one thing that we're committed to is introducing sustainable Bitcoin mining. So the original plan was to use legacy green technology like solar and kind of follow the, the ARK investment and uh, Square research paper of using solar and Bitcoin mining with batteries to create a, a reliable energy grid. But um, one of our co-founders on the team suggested that we look into bio mining, Ricardo out of uh, uh, Cremona out of uh, Mexico. So uh, at this point, we are looking to take uh, basically decomposing organic waste around the lake, feed it into a device, extract the energy from it and mine Bitcoin. And what we're, what we're doing with that is the, the Lake Atitlan is a beautiful lake. It's one of the top 10 most beautiful lakes in the world, but it's, it's uh, being polluted and it's slowly dying because you've got all these unsustainable uh, farming practices that go on around it. And uh, for instance, in Panachel, the, the solid waste facility sits about 800 feet above the, uh, above the town, and they've just got open pits of decomposing organic waste. And it just, when it rains, it just flows down into the river. And the wastewater treatment facility has a giant biodigester that's got uh, leaking methane. So our, our goal is to basically uh, take all those um, sources of stranded and wasted energy, capture it so we can mine Bitcoin. And in doing that, we can finally uh, provide economic incentive and alignment so that everybody around the lake wants to clean the lake. Right now, there's no incentive to get rid of your waste in a sustainable way. You know, um, there's, no, there's no financial incentive to uh, fix the wastewater treatment facility because you're going to use that resource to fix something when you could use the resource somewhere else. And so uh, hopefully, uh, the first week of July, we've got, um, some exciting news and, uh, with related to that. And we're super excited about that. And the thing that I'm super passionate about also is because of the history of the Spaniards in Central and South America coming in, basically, you know, pillaging the land, taking the gold and, and, um, taking it from the people, you know, we all think about, Bitcoin is digital gold. And what we want to do is make sure that that digital gold stays in Guatemala. So we want to provide a universal basic income from this waste, uh, waste to energy project. 
<clears throat> it doesn't mean that they're going to get 100% of the profits, but we want to be able to um, take some portion of the profits that we're getting from the mining and basically distribute it into wallets so that everybody in the community is benefiting and can save for the future. So we're super excited about that for sure. How big is this mining operation that you're bio mining? Well, we don't know yet. So we're, we're doing a proof of concept and I, I don't have the figures in front of me, but um, I think 250 kilowatts is what we're looking at starting with and as a, as a demonstration project. And then we've got um, some strategic partnerships with some other biogas companies in Guatemala that don't know anything about Bitcoin mining. And so we're going to be able to partner with them and um, things are looking really, really uh, bright for for this opportunity in, in Guatemala. Yeah, it certainly sounds um, sounds awesome, man. Like the uh, yeah, the ability to have an area get cleaned up voluntarily by people because they're incentivized, and then to have them gain some sort of funds, uh, as you say, in like a UBI kind of directive way. So that yeah, it sounds uh, sounds like a great plan to be honest. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah. as long as it works, then it's. <laughs> Can't, I can't, you can't really go too wrong, I guess. Well, is the, uh, the answer. yeah, I mean, we'll get this. So we at our at, on one of our meetings, we were uh, we were trying to find a landowner um, that that would host or allow us to lease his land for this project. And we found somebody and we're talking to him and we're telling him that, that this plan about biodigesters and turning organic waste into energy. And, you know, we 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 told him that like within the first five or 10 minutes of the conversation. And he's agreeable. He wants to help because he's really concerned member of the, of the um, community. And then about an hour into the conversation, he tells us that, oh, I've installed three bio digesters. And, we, and, you know, our eyes got like this big and we're like, OK. And he said, well, they're not being used. And so we uh, we literally stopped the meeting and said, go show us these bio digesters. And sure enough, we go up the mountain and there's these giant thousand plus thousands of liter biodigesters that are sitting there they've never been used because they were installed when he left his position after installing them the guy who took over for him didn't know what to do didn't have any motivation to do anything with it so we've got this three hundred thousand dollar resource just sitting there not being used and so we're going to be able to use that off the out of the out of the gate to start mining and all a hundred percent of that energy and money will go into that community because that's that's their that's their resource how many miners would those three biodigesters power we have not that we have not figured out yet but it would be a lot um it would be uh it would be meaningful it would definitely be meaningful for every and there i think they're about 1300 to 2000 people in that community so it would be a significantly meaningful amount of bitcoin that would change their lives have you guys uh contacted like any of these asic manufacturers to see if they might donate or like um give you like older machines or anything like that to kind of bootstrap the project we 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 did um for some, you know, we're not an organized nonprofit. And so when it came down to compliance, there was a, there was some, some friction there. You know, we don't want to give you, you know, Patrick Melder, those miners, um, because we can't fill out the pro appropriate uh, mining documents. So I, I have not set up a, an official uh, nonprofit. Um, I just, uh, I didn't know where this was going to go. And I just, we've not done that. And, but I think at this point, we're in the, we're in the phase of, of opportunity where that's going to be less of an issue we're gonna we're gonna be able to get the miners that we need without a problem no it makes a lot of sense and i think people will be willing to help especially when it comes to like yeah different mining companies potentially donating older machines or uh, it sounds i mean fantastic like you could really have something going you know where you've got like you're using this 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 equipment that as you said has just been there not being used um and then you can it's just, yeah it's astonishing really it's kind of like uh yeah. there's elements of little bits of good luck there which is great and if it just feels like it's kind of a you know destiny right like this should should happen um lawrence remember i'm a christian so we use different <laughs> words <laughs> blessing good. yeah definite blessing yeah good point yeah, yeah 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 but either way like yeah it's it's wonderful so i and it'd be cool to because obviously if this is then a success it could potentially inspire 
other areas, right? They can see Bitcoin Beach and say this was like a kind of more tourist base, but organic still and other things. And then obviously the Bitcoin Lake could be again a bit of tourism, but also like, hey, using natural wastes, well, not natural, but waste that was naturally there because people kept dumping, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It could be like a, another case study, I guess, to persuade uh, local areas and, and different sort of teams to actually do something with, uh, with Bitcoin. So it's really exciting stuff as far as I'm concerned, man. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, the way we look at it is it's a comp we are moving into a complete decentralization of Bitcoin mining and uh, waste management. So you know, everything has been centralized, uh, including energy generation and waste management. And with this technology and with these incentives, we can bring opportunity like this down to the to a local community. You know, um, we could work with home builders or developers that want to implement a solution like this rather than tying into the grid or to a, a sewage facility. They, they could start mining Bitcoin uh, in a development because um, they'll have enough homes and waste to generate their own energy. In fact, one of the one of the the technologies that we're looking at, we've we've secured the rights to a technology. Once we um, once the plan is in operation, um, I think it's within about twelve hours. It's it's self sustaining. You don't need any power from the grid at all. So it'll once we get it going, it's running on its own from its own energy that it creates from this waste. Have you um, come across the work of Michael Schmid? We just interviewed him. He's mm -hmm. a guy that's working on using ASICs to like heat water heaters. So your water heater basically mines every time you take a shower uh, kind of thing. Um, it sounds like with this bio digestion mining that you guys are doing, and then like the applications of using the excess heat from the miners for other applications, like this could really, uh, you know, like they would integrate really well together. Yeah, yeah. The the I actually have a Bitcoin miner uh, S9 here in my home, and in the winter I hooked it up to my HVAC system and heated my basement. So I'm very familiar with using that excess heat. And um, there's, you know, excess heat in Guatemala, certainly um, at altitude, because the lake is about five thousand feet, and then in the mountains around it, it gets up to about eight thousand feet. So the definitely the nights are chilly, and you could dir certainly divert some of that that heat from the miners for, for heating in homes and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, we were talking to Michael, um, about like ways you can actually use it to even like do air conditioning and stuff like that. And obviously that's a lot wow. more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think we really settled on like, he wasn't entirely certain, but we were pretty, we were pretty confident that there's, there's gotta be some kind of way from seeing like other people having done similar kind of applications. So yeah, it could be it could be interesting to see if that would be possible. I mean, imagine you've got like, yeah, you've got the waste, which is then throwing the Bitcoin, which is then using for the air conditioning, which is then, and it's almost like you're creating this like yeah. full on circular, well, circular economy, but but also like, you know, it's kind of like recycling. Yeah, it's, the, the possibilities are pretty endless, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty exciting stuff. I mean, I'd, I'd love to come and visit, uh, obviously, you know, being practical. <sighs> you know not, maybe this year but um but it'd be cool to come visit though and see like how things go um yeah i'd love to have you yeah for sure uh, and support and i think anyone else out there listening as well like uh as, as you said if, if someone wants to go they can get in touch with you and yeah and you said it was a uh, say it's bitcoin lake dot um what was the website uh bitcoin lake dot io dot io and then uh the twitter handle which i had open earlier and i closed is bitcoin lake bitcoin no it's it's lake bitcoin on twitter Gotcha. So, so look at our name, Lago Bitcoin. Lago is Lake in Spanish, so it's Lake Bitcoin on Twitter. Gotcha. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, Lake Patrick, Bitcoin. I had a quick question. Um, I, in El Salvador, they have this like phenomenon of volcanoes and, and geothermal uh, energy for mining, which is like a huge project that they're going to do Bitcoin City with. I know that Guatemala also has a lot of volcanic activity mm -hmm. and probably geothermal energy. Have yeah. you guys like? looked at that as like a source of energy for mining? No, because the, those are, that's big money. That's big CapEx, you know? So uh, Guatemala has, air, especially on the lake, we have every source of renewable energy available, hydro, wind, solar, geothermal, um, and now, you know, uh, bio mining and all that. So we, we, like I said, we started with solar, but then since we're bootstrapping everything on our own, solar is expensive, you know? And so when we 
started going down the, the energy cycle and we came across biomining, that just made perfect sense for us. So we can get going pretty quickly uh, without a lot of capital. And that's, that's why, but yeah, I mean, the, the mountains around the lake are in fact, inactive volcanoes. So th this is, there are active geothermal hot springs around the lake as well. Yeah, there's, uh, there's certainly a lot of possibilities on the globe, isn't there? Um, I can tell, it's like when I was watching, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but there was an episode of uh, Jordan Peterson's podcast with uh, Safe Dean on it. Uh, and like seeing Michael, Michael, um, seeing Jordan Peterson, I was going to say Michael Jordan. It would love to, it'd love to see Michael Jordan get into Bitcoin, but that's not the case, uh, as far as I'm aware. But seeing Jordan Peterson get like super pumped about like when he realized about like the kind of, oh, the possibilities of Bitcoin mining. And he's like, what? And then he get, they get, the conversation goes in this yeah. other direction. It's like, uh, it's kind of like how I feel right now, realizing the kind of different natural things there are and like waste and the volcanoes and there's so many different ways um that you can literally just be generating free money whilst also clearing things up that's um, right and then supporting the local community which is um yeah. amazing quite frankly yeah. as far as i'm concerned yeah. so it gets me excited and anyone out there listening it should be getting you excited too that's awesome <laughs> that's for sure um, but I don't know, yeah, Ricardo, is there any more questions you had? Because I, I think I've just, we've bombarded you. I don't think there's anything else I can even think of to ask. I know about the food. I was, oh, do they have pupusas? Or is that like an El Salvador thing? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, my first pupusa was actually in Guatemala. So um, there are several uh, Salvadorans that ha have shops there in Panachel. And in fact, that's where I had it. So uh, owned by Salvadoran. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Because I, I mean, I, I had a pupusa in El Salvador, but like I wanted to get an actual one made by like, you know, a mum or whatever. But I, I think I only had one at like the, at the Adopting Bitcoin conference, which obviously is like mass produced <laughs> pupusa. I was like, damn. You didn't hit up the street vendors lines? No, dude, I really wanted to. But like, I think we had like the schedule and everything was, you know, I never ended up actually managing to do it. But the breakfasts well, I had were amazing when I was in El Salvador. I loved them. Or you can just make your own. I like to cook, so I make my own pupusas. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Well, I, I, might, I might be able to do it here. I guess it, I'm sure it's like maybe a little bit different on the quality of the corn flour or whatever yeah, that's used. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise... Well, it, well, it's like all cooking, though. I mean, the secret ingredients love. So when you got the mama on the side of the street making the pupusas, there's a lot of love in that. <laughs> damn right love and pounds yeah. of butter <laughs> <laughs> right yeah that's right that's right yeah yeah i oh, love it well um yeah i don't know ricardo do you have anything else or are you good yeah no i think i'm good uh patrick i wanted to say thank you for coming on and accepting the interview like this was super fascinating for me to hear about your efforts uh with the bitcoin lake that you're the project and then also the bio mining like i didn't even know that was a possibility that's super interesting so um thank you yeah, my pleasure. And if people want to learn kind of the, the school full scope of things from beginning to end, I started kind of putting the plan together in September of last year, and it's all on Medium. So my my if you just search Bitcoin Lake on Medium or my uh, Medium handle, which is 67 Corvette, uh, you can see, you know, the progression of thought. And after every major trip, I kind of codify what I've learned. So we have kind of a, a living historical document of what's going on. And for our Christian Bitcoiners out here, where can they get your books? Amazon. You can just type in my name on Amazon and, and get them on Amazon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that out, actually, myself and see if I can pick up the, um, the, the more recent one that you said that was like kind of more relevant. Because it'd be interesting to see the perspective. <clears throat> um, but yeah, dude, that's just, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure thanks guys yeah. yeah it's been super interesting for me and like kind of you know give me a bit of like a passion on a friday evening in the here in the uk so it's pretty cool that's awesome thanks guys appreciate it so much oh thanks for, well i say thanks for coming on um i say everyone out there listening uh head over to lake bitcoin on on, on twitter and you can check everything out you've got the links to uh, a shopify you've got an email um you've got bitcoinlake.io the website so you can find out pretty much everything you want to from there give it follow you can send sats you can yep. send sats yeah. uh you can send love whatever um but yeah uh, thanks for, for, for coming on patrick for sure and um for everyone out there listening we hope you enjoyed it we hope you had a good time uh i hope you have an awesome day week month year keep loving life keep being great and of course keep buying bitcoin see you later mm -hmm.